and writing them down for a living. Wouldn't we all love to do that? And then having them become New York Times best-selling books at that. How does one go from being a businesswoman to writing historical fiction to writing crime fiction? My guest today has done all of that and is here to share her journey and experiences with the Salem Witch Trials, Pioneer Texas, and A Woman Detective. Join me with my conversation with Kathleen Kent. Hi, and welcome to Coffee with Claire. As you regular viewers and listeners know, we're always meeting and talking with business leaders, entrepreneurs, and those who give back and have fun. My guest today is Kathleen Kent. Kathleen is the author of three best-selling historical novels, The Heretic's Daughter, The Traitor's Wife, and The Outcasts. Please help me welcome Kathleen Kent. I'm so glad you're here, Kathleen. Thank you, Claire. I am so excited. I love reading. <laughs> And I love writing, and uh, your you know your background is so incredibly interesting because you've done what a lot of people dream of doing mm. and made this your reality. You right. know, people sit in their cubes all day long, and they're like, "I know I have a book in me," you know, and they they dream about it and then never do anything. Right. You know, and it's and it's real easy to get stuck in the business world because you know it's it's busy. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I I got started writing relatively late in life. I had gone to college with the idea that I wanted to be a writer. Oh. And about my sophomore year, my dad, who was a businessman and a very reasonable human being, pulled me aside and he said, about that writing thing, <laughs> how do you expect to make a living? <laughs> that sounds like a dad thing yeah, to say. Yeah, <laughs> it was a dad thing to say. And uh, so we talked about it and he convinced me to change my major to business. And I did. I finished college at UT, mm -hmm. moved to New York, where I worked in various commercial enterprises for 20 years. Wow. And it was, I loved, my, I loved my work. I worked for 10 years for the chairman of the Commodity Exchange. Oh my goodness, you were busy. Yes, very busy. And then I worked for 10 years as a contractor to the Department of Defense, traveling oh, wow. to the former Soviet Union from 1990 to the late 90s. And I did a lot of writing, but it was contract writing. Mm. So the Department of Defense really discourages creative writing. <laughs> they want just Do the facts. Do not make anything up. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, in the back of my mind, like a lot of people, I had a story that I wanted to tell. Yeah. Um, and you're absolutely right. You can get so caught up in life. You know, I had a, I had a young son. I was married. I was traveling a lot. Sure. And I kept saying someday yeah um but um as i reached my mid 40s i started losing some people that were very important to me the, the repository of some family stories and you know often when the storyteller is gone the story is gone as well right and i i had this this urge to uh take a leap of faith and uh so i quit my job of 20 years, my career that wow. I spent 20 years building, mm -hmm. moved from New York back to Texas. And as soon as my son started school, I started writing my first story. Um, and I, it was a process, it was a journey. I had the discipline of being in business for 20 years, mm -hmm. but I had to learn from the ground floor up how, how to write a book. Yeah, and it's a process, you know, it's mm. it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, you just all of a sudden get an idea and you type it out and you're all done, you know, it's like, you've got to look at it more than one time. <laughs> it It is a process. And I thought, when I started it in the early 2000s, my first book, I thought, how hard can this be? <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a natural I'm, writer. I'm a natural writer. <laughs> I know how to do this. And I found that it was it's one thing thinking it and one thing talking about it and it's another thing actually doing it and the yeah. process took me five years to complete the first book the 
I think part of the reason that I was so driven to write the book was because it was based on family history. Mm. And so the first the first book, which is The Heretic's Daughter, is based on my nine times great grandmother who was hanged as a witch in oh, Salem wow. in sixteen ninety two. And I grew up hearing the story of Martha Carrier. Mm -hmm. And the first time I heard the story, I was about eight years old. I was visiting my mother's parents in Pennsylvania. And being eight years old, I, I wasn't paying too much attention until I heard my grandmother say something about an ancestor who was hanged as a witch. Oh, so that got my attention. Of course, I knew what a witch was. You know, I'd spend a few years at Halloween right. dressing as a witch, right? So I... But I had the cartoon image of a witch in mind. I didn't know the history. I didn't know the context. Right. And my grandmother gave me all of these incredible stories, family stories, about the Carrier family mm -hmm. that lived in Massachusetts. And Martha Carrier, because she was an herbalist and because she was a midwife, she had long been suspected of being a witch. But when I asked my grandmother once if Martha Carrier was really a witch, she said, sweetheart, there are no such things as witches, just ferocious women. Ooh, Ooh yeah, that's ferocious powerful. women. And I think she became sort of the blueprint for me for what a ferocious woman was. And I don't think it was any coincidence that I took her lead and worked in two fields, the commodities, yeah. the commodity exchange, and working with the DOD, which is a male-dominated right. field both of them yeah lots of self-confidence I, I get i got a lot of confidence from the women in my family yeah so, so. that is so important you yeah. know to to have that and carry that forward and be a role model for others as you're you know coming up in the business to to bring them up with you exactly and and show them that you know it doesn't have to be a man's world it doesn't have to be a woman's world it can be our world right and who's the best person to handle the job let's just you know, grade from there. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think the way you build muscles is through progressive resistance. You pick up heavier and heavier weights and you build stronger muscles that way. Right. And the headwind that I faced in business those 20 years in New York really strengthened me in ways that I didn't really appreciate until I left my career and started doing something totally different. I knew nothing about publishing. I knew nothing about, really I knew nothing about writing a book. It Those five years that I spent researching and writing the book, I educated myself. And I think you can talk yourself out of anything. Oh, absolutely. And if you're unsure, you can step back and not take the risk. But I thought I would get to the end of my life and feel a lot of regret if mm -hmm. I didn't try it. I didn't tell a lot of people that I was working on that first book because I'm in my late 40s. My son is in school. And when somebody asks you, you know, what, what business are you in or what do you do? If you're in your 20s, right out of college, and you tell someone you're writing a book, they say, of course, foolish person. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to write a book. You're supposed to throw your life away and write a book. Um, but, but when you're more mature and supposed to know better, I, I was unsure of my abilities. I was unsure of my talent. So it was a very solitary process. I got a lot of encouragement from close friends and family. But I didn't know, you know, your family... It's, it's in the contract, in the small print, they have to like your work, you know, they're supposed to. I didn't know if it was going to be a story that would be accepted and embraced more widely. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a good story. The, the story of the heretic's daughter is about Martha Carrier, but more broadly, it's about women finding their own courage. And the remarkable thing about Martha Carrier was that even though a lot of people admitted to being witches and thereby saved from hanging, she refused to bear false witness against herself and against her neighbors. So she was hanged even when four of her five children were arrested. Two of her sons were tortured wow. to compel her to testify and she wouldn't. That kind of resolve, that mm -hmm. kind of cleaving to the truth, to me I thought was a story that needed to be told and it's told the book the heretic's daughter is told through the voice of her young daughter mm. and in the beginning of the book um, I think a lot of women 
we find our own unique voices in opposition to our mothers, <laughs> banging heads. Yeah. And it's a story of a mother, it's a mother-daughter story, and in the beginning of the book they are in opposition to one another. And as the trials progress, and as her mother's put in prison, mm -hmm. and as her brothers, and as she herself is arrested, she learns the true value and worth of her mother's bravery. Mm -hmm. And there is, um, there is an understanding of her mother's true sacrifice. So that was what the story was about, not only about the witch trials and why family members and neighbor turned against neighbor, but a gr coming of age story for a young girl. So it was a it was a labor of love, a love letter to my carrier family. Yeah. And when it was finished, I didn't have an agent. I didn't know much about publishing. So I started sending out query letters, which I thought, you know, very cogently written query letters. I said, I could do this. I can sure. write a grammatically correct letter. <laughs> and then I started getting uh, rejection responses. And I got about 60 rejection responses. Six zero? 60 no's. Oh. <laughs> um, and my dad, who was a salesman, said that the distance between no and yes is the degree to which you can tolerate hearing the word no. That you can hmm. fall down and get up, you know, fall down 19 times and get up 20. Yeah. So I kept at it, and he was very, the man that told me that I should get work in, you know, in business mm -hmm. was my biggest supporter. And he said, just keep, just stick with it. And I got an agent in New York. She had gone to Vassar and had done her master's thesis on the Salem witch trials. Oh. So it was a per, it was like finding the perfect dance partner. Right. It was a perfect match. And she got me a tremendous book deal. Uh, it, made within two weeks it made the new york times best-selling list and it's now published in 17 countries wow so it that risk that chance had i never taken that chance i never would have a career writing now so you know you really have embodied perseverance and endurance and self-confidence and self-motivation you know those are really things that are innate traits you know they're not necessarily trainable you know you you mm. do you do you feel like that you pulled that from your family tree and a lot of ferocious women yeah. yeah um i think part of it is innate maybe it's celtic stubbornness i don't know <laughs> but it's also like you said, that network of supportive women, my grandmother, my mother, my female friends, that's so important, especially when you're risk taking, oh, yeah. when you're starting off with a new venture, that, um, that pod of, of female positivity is really valuable. And I got a lot of that, so it yeah. helped. Well, and when when we have that, we are it, it kind of buoys you up. That and your dad, you know, yeah. have, be, having that you know really nice male energy cheerleader for you, yes. as well as the the women support system. You know, you had a nice balance there. I did. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And yeah. so you know, and and we don't all have that, but we all have something similar that we can pull from if we are uh, introspective and and really pay attention. And I think right. a lot of people, you know, they suppress all of those things because they feel like they have to do something you know like I have to stay in this job because this is my chosen field and I don't want to look foolish right or I'm afraid of um, you know changing this path because I feel very responsible to everyone that depends on me um, so what a great testament to your just taking that leap of faith and letting that net appear for yourself right. you know it didn't appear overnight you know, five years is a long time. It was a long road. Uh, the thing, I've taught some writing classes, and when young or newly uh, smitten writers ask me, you know, what's one of the major keys to finishing a book? And that's, <laughs> a lot of that is the being able to withstand the tyranny of the blank page. Ooh. Because a lot of people think that the muse descends on your shoulders and it just everything tumbles <laughs> for it just pours out of my heart it just pours out of my heart <laughs> from my head through right. my fingertips sometimes in rare moments you do get hit by lightning and it flows um but i think most of the time it's just brute force it's mm. 
trying to uh, tolerate those periods of time where you get stuck and doing things like taking a walk, taking a drive, mm -hmm. um, letting your subconscious bubble up to the surface. You have all the answers. Right. It's just getting your conscious mind, that judge, yeah. that that drill sergeant that says, <laughs> what are you doing? You should, you should be doing something different. Stop goofing off. Stop, stop having fun. <laughs> yeah, right. how dare you? Yeah, how dare you? <laughs> right. Yeah, all of those things. Um, Stephen King calls it the little men in the basement. And that sometimes taking a walk meditating, taking a long country drive, lets your conscious mind go to sleep so that the, those little men can come to the surface. Mm. And oftentimes if I felt static or, or stuck in, in the, the narrative of the story, having those quiescent moments really will bring me a burst of creative energy. So, sure. Yeah, yeah. You bring us to relax a little bit and say, yeah. okay, now let's, what's next, you know? Right. Um, and you've, so you you coach new um, writers as well. I have well? taught. Okay. I have taught. Yeah. And uh, so when they t ask you about the writer's block, I think that's what you're talking about with right. the blank pa that's what, page. Right. It's like you know, right. just chill out for a minute. You right. know, just give yourself a break. It doesn't have to be done today. You know, not right. everything. And maybe you just do one thing today. You know, but you keep doing right. one thing every right. day, and then pretty soon, you know, you've got something that's really amazing, like all the books that you've done. I think it's. And maybe this comes with age and wisdom, being kind to yourself. Yeah. I'm a very slow writer. I write three sentences and erase two. I'm just <laughs> slow. It takes as long as it takes. And you know, you look at someone like Donna Tartt, who won the Pulitzer for the Goldfinch. It takes her about 10 years in between books. Mm. Um, so I try to, I try to coach perseverance, mm -hmm. but also patience with oneself. And as you said, that's key. If you get one really good paragraph on the page, if you were to write one page a day at the end of one year, you would have a book. Yeah, absolutely. You take it, it's like a meal. You can't eat the whole thing at once. It <laughs> right. just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't taste good. Brick. It wouldn't feel good. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, and you know, do you find that as you give yourself that time, um, to let the ideas marinate, that they become richer and stronger through that marination period? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's a very important part of the creative process, whether you're painting, sculpting, weaving, um, creating comedy. There's, there is a part of yourself that has to be reflective and introspective. You have to give yourself time to, to to let those ideas ferment, and um, I, you know, now I've just I've just finished my fifth book, which will be published in February. The process, in some ways, gets easier, but it's but what remains the same is that it's not just meeting everybody else's expectations; it's meeting your own expectations of of excellence, right? And that's balancing that expectation with also being patient and kind with yourself and all of those together is where the brilliance occurs you know and like you said and allowing yourself to totally finish it because there's a, lots of people out there that have half written books in their closets and right, in the bottom right. of the file cabinet it's right. like well you know i got started but god you know it was just i i just couldn't finish it well it's because they didn't allow themselves up that break that you give yourself you know that opportunity to just you know chill out for a minute and then start again so you've got yeah. you've got five books i have four published four, and then you're three working. works of historical fiction okay and then i started i was challenged because my historical fiction career was going so well, I decided to jump off the cliff again. Oh, of course. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and start writing crime. And what happened was I had finished my third work of historical fiction. It's called The Outcasts. And it's about Texas after the Civil War. Very classic historical fiction work. And a friend of mine who's a publisher called me up and he said, um, I'm putting an anthology of crime stories together based in Dallas. Do you have, do you have anything like that? And being the good fiction writer that I am, I lied and said, I think so. I think I'm. <laughs> of course I do. Oh, yes. Of course I do. How much time do I have? And he said, Oh, a couple of weeks. Send it in. So I love crime fiction. I've read a lot of crime fiction, but I'd never, I'd never written even a short story of crime fiction. So I thought, All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet the challenge. So I called up a cousin, a first cousin of mine, who's 
um, a police officer. He's worked narcotics undercover. He's worked vice undercover. He's been with a SWAT team in Plano. Um, he's got fascinating stories. So I called him up and I said, okay, I'm taking you to lunch and you have to tell me the worst. <laughs> you gotta <laughs> give me all of the great stories. I'll change all the names to protect the innocent or the guilty. So we started getting together and he fed me some stories with some changes, changing the names, dates, and places. Sure. And I wrote a story called Coincidences Can Kill You. And I sent it in, the publisher loved it, and it was in an anthology called Dallas Noir. Awesome. Which was a lot of uh, Ben Franklin, uh, Ben Franklin, <laughs> not Ben Franklin. Um, oh, I've forgotten his name. Oh, shame on me. It's okay, there was a, there was a lot of a guy in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, okay. I'll think of his name in a minute. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe I haven't remembered his name. Anyway, he's, he's a very popular Dallas, Texas writer. So uh, the book came out. The publisher at Little Brown loved the story. And she said, you know, I think there's a book here. It's very unique. We're used to a lot of crime uh, stories being written in New York and Boston yeah, and L.A. Yeah, Dallas, yeah. But Dallas, and we it's a very pretty city. Mm -hmm. It's a very... Um, privileged city, but we have the same problems that every other big city has. We have gangs, we have drugs, we've got um, all kinds of vices here. So I set it in Dallas. My main protagonist is a woman named Detective Betty Rizik, and she's from Brooklyn. And uh, this is the dime. This was the novel from the short story. Wow. Well, gosh, Kathleen, you have done so many incredible things in your life, and it has been a privilege and honor to have you here with us at Coffee with Claire. Thank um, you, Claire. Can you let our um, listeners and our uh, viewers know how to get a hold of you if they would like to know more information about you? Absolutely. They can go to my website, KathleenKent.com, or email me at uh, KathleenKent at Yahoo.com. And I'm very good about responding to emails. Of course you are. You're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do. Well, thank you again, Kathleen, for joining us today. And thanks to our listeners and our viewers. Please be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We'll see you next time on Coffee with Claire. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Coffee with Claire. To learn more about today's guests, visit their website or find them on Facebook. To learn more about me, Claire Billingsley, follow me on LinkedIn or visit my website at coffeewithclaire.tv. And to hear more episodes of Coffee with Claire, subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast and social media platforms.